Hello. Uh, my name is Barry Rubinell. I am uh, had a pretty long career. My, for most of my career, I was uh, an editor uh, for documentaries and um, other shows. Um, and uh, I worked with uh, a producer and director named Tom Neff, and he um, eight years ago started the Documentary Channel. And so he and I, you know, and some others, <laughs> ran the Documentary Channel for uh, the last eight years. But then we were recently purchased by uh, Participant Media, and uh, they're starting. They started their own channel August 1st. So in any case, I've had a lot of production experience and post-production experience, and some TV executive experience. <laughs> I am Katie Wincor. I work at Regular Productions, which uh, we our biggest show right now is City Walk, which we do for KCT, and it's a show about walking and urban planning. So I uh, help with segment producing and coordinating all of our various shoots that combine to make our 30-minute show each week. And I actually come from a narrative background in cinematography, so I am finding some interesting connections with narrative and documentary filmmaking. Fabulous. Fantastic group, isn't it? So you've got something, you know, you've got from, you know, the, the, the small docs that, you know, purchased by a participant, Him the Himalayan uh, motorcyclist, which I've heard about, which is fantastic, and TV, and then maybe, you know, Web Interactive, which would be me. So um, I was going to ask each of the folks here, you know, how you got started. You know, what interested you in going the doc route, maybe rather than narrative, or maybe you did both? Um, perhaps, Barry, you could start off. Sure. Um, well, my first interest was editing. I, I knew I wanted to be an editor more than a producer or director. I, I've never, I have by now produced a bunch of things, and, and I'm, you know, I do, I'm okay at it. I'm pretty good at it. But I've never liked being on the set because it's just, to me, it's nerve wracking. I know a lot of people get off on that kind of energy. Um, I'm, I'm sure Adam does. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Very different, probably in that way. To me, the exciting thing is sitting in a room, you know, that's temperature controlled, and um, <laughs> you're not worried about the sun going down, and and you know, people coming that weren't supposed to be there, or whatever. All the production problems you could have, and and just dealing with all this maze of footage, and and putting it together into something that's really great, and um, that that that's true for dramatic films. But in documentary, the editor is even more of the director or the filmmaker because there isn't usually a script. Um, you, usually there's a bunch of interviews and a bunch of other footage, and there's an, you know, obviously the director knows what he's going for, but it's, there's just a lot, a lot of room for creativity with the editor. And to me, that's a very, very exciting challenge, and it still is today. And I'm, Kind of glad that participant fired me, and now I'm going back into filmmaking, <laughs> and not a TV exec anymore. Because I, I mean, I enjoyed that; it was very exciting, and I was I was pretty good. But this is what I said over and over the last eight years. I said, I'm pretty good at this. I'm a pretty good manager. I'm a pretty good executive, but I'm a really, really good editor, and that's what I really, really love. And hopefully, that's what I'm getting back into. Did that answer the question? Yeah, that was great. Dad, Adam, why don't you go next? Oh, what got us in? What got us in? Uh, well, let me let me start off by saying I was an engineer in college, just so you know. And that's, you know, when when Barry's talking about finding the film and editing, you know, this is what as my engineering skills would come in there. When myself and the editor, you know, the story producers are looking to find and and define this puzzle, I find it incredibly fun. Um, but after engineering, I was leaning more towards comedy and writing theatrical film, fictional films, uh, and then I just kind of came across documentary when I was actually invited to go on this motorcycle trip in the Himalayas by my teacher, uh, Anand, in India. And I said yes to go on this trip, and uh, I didn't know how to ride a motorcycle, uh, but said yes anyway, and then I went about, okay, how do I produce a documentary? So I really learned documentary in, in the field, and I, I don't think you can get too much harder. You can get harder, but to be filming for 35 days, always on the go, uh, and facing death-defying traffic, I was a writer in the film as well as producing the, my first film. Um, so I definitely like <laughs> being outside and going crazy. That's how I got into to documentary filmmaking, and, um, and I've loved it ever since. And then, like I said, Kazakhstan and then going back again. So it's been a sweet culmination of engineering skills and that part of my mind 
with the creativity of finding story and expressing story and, and the things things that I love. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Katie, you want to talk? Um, I think I got into documentary when I was in film school. I went to USC for grad school, and we were forced to do these projects with a partner. Uh, my partner was the only person that wanted to do a documentary, and it was about diving, which seemed like a pretty bland subject at the time, but I had never had so much creative opportunity as a cinematographer, so that kind of opened my eyes to that world. And um, really, my current job is what has kind of solidified my interest in documentary, just finding these amazing characters and true life stories I find pretty interesting. That's great. So uh, what, what's interesting, again, for the, about their different backgrounds is I'm kind of wondering, you know, you were kind of, I guess, uh, you know, somewhat thrown into it. You targeted it by, you know, through editing, right, you know, creating and finding a story in the footage that you had, and then you actually, you know, studied it. So I'm curious, and maybe you're curious about, hopefully, you know, uh, whether, you know, is this an objective, you know, sort of a thing you're going to go find the story within the, the interesting people and interesting characters, or do you set up with an objective in mind, and it's going to be subjective. You're going to take a slant on it, and it's going to be, you know, your story through these people. I'm kind of wondering what kind of influence there is there, and maybe you've seen it done well and seen it maybe not done so well. You want to go first? Yeah. Uh, it's, I don't think it's objective. It's objective at all. But, uh, I mean, it is, but everything's subjective, and you're telling the part of the story you want. If you ask anyone on the motorcycle trip what happened as compared to the film, it's absolutely different. Um, absolutely different. One would say, oh, my gosh, there's so much more bonding than you guys were able to show, or it's so much more scary than you're able to show. You just can't capture. So we definitely, um, I, myself, with these type of documentaries that I do, with the process type documentaries that I love where you're unraveling as you go, which is incredibly fun, um, it's, it's for me more theme more message and I knew going in that the first film would be all about fear and all about death my teacher had a prophecy he would die in his late 20s and so this film and the death is just everywhere in India um, so this film was really we knew it would be about that so a lot of the questions and what we were looking at was going to go towards that this recent series I knew it was about freedom and we were going to look at the things that bind us in, in freedom that keep us jailed uh, so for me it's more themology and then looking and, and paying attention to it uh, because there's so much going on, you've got to focus just like in life on one, one thing and really just bring it to light. So for me, it's very much subjective in that way. Yeah, yeah I, I would say it's impossible for a documentary not to be subjective. I think, uh, you know, you go in with a point of view. I think you need to be open that if you, you know, if you're – depending on the type of film, I mean, but if it's a type of film, which most are, where it sort of reveals itself as you're shooting and things happen and you end up going down different paths, you know, your ideas could change, but, but you have to have a clear idea of what you want before you start, even if it does change down the road. And um, plus, I just think it's impossible to be, I mean, if you want 50-50 side, especially of a political film or a film about, you know, an issue-oriented film, I worked on a lot of films with Tom about artists, and it's a little hard. I mean, obviously, we had a point of view about that person, but, you know, I think the question of objectivity and subjectivity really comes into with, like, films about, you know, politics or, you know, different political issues or, or whatever, worldwide issues, and, and um, um, what was I going to say? Uh, so, you know, usually those are, I mean, if you want a 50-50, then, you know, you got to you can go to CNN or something. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? I mean, it's up, I think it's the responsibility of the filmmaker to, to reveal it. I mean, it's actually a very tricky question because uh, one of the things I did on the Doc Channel was a show called Doc Talk where we interviewed documentary filmmakers. So I interviewed a lot of documentary filmmakers. This is the kind of question that would come up a lot. And, um, you know, the, the, a lot of people obviously have different viewpoints on it, but it's there's no way to not be subjective even if you want it to be, and most of them really want to be. Most of them have a point of view that they want to get out. Um, that's great. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah, I, w I would have to agree. Um, I don't know how e one would be completely objective, but I definitely find myself um, connecting more to documentaries that don't have too heavy-handed of an agenda. Um, so I try 
in our show to not kind of impose an agenda on our subjects. But yeah, I think you definitely have a viewpoint that comes across and I feel like with the editing it's similar on the production side, you need to really find your story and find your characters and then get their message across. That's great. So <clears throat> I do have a question about that, you know, kind of finding the story as you're out there, I mean, which is, you know, pretty much the opposite of, uh, you know, having a script and going out and you have 35 days and here's the 90 pages, et cetera. Um, can you tell us about, uh, you know, your, you know, your, your, you know, your checklist, your shot sheet, you know, what, what are you going to get and how flexible are you when you start shooting to what you end up with? Um, I think flexibility is key, definitely, um, which I think translates to narrative film as well. But in documentary, it's a lot about um, the overall subject and kind of in our planning for it, really finding not only the imagery, but also the stories that will tie into the greater picture um, and sound. Uh, definitely, we've had issues, as I think a lot of documentaries have, where the sound's not there and it's something that gets overlooked sometimes, then you don't have your story anymore. So, definitely a lot of planning. Um, I think I'll answer this one with a, a kind of a case study. Um, the last documentary uh, that uh, I did with my friend Tom uh, was about eight years ago, right before the channel started. It was called Chances, the Women of Magdalene. A really good film. It hasn't gotten much run. I doubt anybody's seen it. But it's about uh, an organization called Magdalene House in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, that saves uh, or tries to save women on the street, like cr uh, crack-addicted uh, prostitutes and women who are on the street and in bad shape. And they've had an incredible success rate, and it's, it's just a very dynamic, uh, unusual, and, and interesting um, Organization. So, Tom knew he wanted to make a, f we, or we knew he wanted to make a film about this organization, um, and so you were asking like a checklist. So we knew obviously we would interview this woman Becca, who was the head of it. We knew we were going to interview the women. We knew we would go to some of. The, w they were building a new house. That's actually what started. I mean, this is again a case study. I mean, what happened is they were talking about making a film, but there wasn't really a film. There was no money, but Tom had a camera, so. They were opening a new house for, for the women, and they were having the groundbreaking. So he went to that and just shot that. And I hear this kind of story a lot. Um, so he went and shot the groundbreaking, which was really great, and he interviewed a couple people there. And um, and it just sort of grew from there. He was able to, you know, we were able to cut together a little two- or three-minute thing from that, and you start showing that to people. And then went to another event and then started following some of the women's stories because some of them fell out and back on the street. and. You know, so things just kind of grew. But you, you have a plan, and then you try to stick to it as best you can. And then kind of take it from there. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, same with uh, all that. And then just, you know, make sure you get your shots. You know, make sure you get somebody, w your establishing shot, walking in, walking out. These things do help your editor, right? You, I'm sure sometimes you've been cussing at the <laughs> director of photography, being like, oh, my God, why didn't you hold that camera still for just a little longer? <laughs> Give me ten more seconds so I can fade. Give me... Just give me that establishing shot. So some of those things can be just so important and helpful in post-production. And, and of course, like they all said, for the flexibility to be able to say, oh, wow, this is a good story, this side story. Let me, let me dive deeper into it while I'm here. And to have the confidence to know that your intuition is right. And just go for it. And if it doesn't end up working in the, in the post-production, it's okay. It's a documentary. Just shoot 150 hours. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Just keep going. Just shoot, shoot, shoot. I mean, my, my DPs, God love them. We just work our butts off, you know? We just go, go, go. And I have to be the guy that's, you know, working harder than them, so to speak. You know, just staying up later and making sure that they follow suit. Yeah, so work hard. So uh, is this hitting the mark for you guys? Is this the kind of things you want to know about? Um, how about the inspiration for the stories? I mean, you know, very, very three different, you know, different uh, kind of stories you've told already, and maybe things you're looking at. Where do you find inspiration? Where do you find the stories besides the side story on set, which is really interesting too? Uh, for me, it's things I'm passionate about in, in terms of the highest pass and the four sacred peaks. Um, when the dust settles, the Kazakh one, I was approached with it, and when she explained the story and the tragedy that was going on there, you know, that was enough. 
uh, just to get the word out, you know, to, to understand that her heart was pure and she wanted to make this film and um, and already had a budget, which is important, you know, and already had um, investors. And so when she wanted to bring me on, it's just a beautiful story. So, uh, and when a fellow filmmakers or idea people come up and say, I got this idea for a documentary, if it, if it hits and I see all the different storylines, then then great. And if there's a cause underneath it, be it a human cause or or social cause, but human for me is really, really important. If there's something I know my fellow humans can get out of it on, in terms of how they can live better, mm. how they can go beyond who they are, then that really piques my interest. So with the, the Kazakh documentary, I wanted to also feature uh, the woman that was going there trying to help and that difficulty as well. Like how do you help such a huge problem? Something we face, hey, I got all these issues in my life or all these, uh, all these causes, how do I? Or if you're watching Pivot every day, then you know that there's 3,000 causes. How do I help 3,000 darn causes? You know, it's just too much. How do I choose one, and then what can I do? So the human cause for me is very, very important, and knowing that I connect with that would be probably the first thing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would just echo uh, what Adam was saying in, in that I think passion is absolutely essential um, because whatever it is, this is a this is a topic and 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 people and a project that you're going to be living with for many many years and probably forever really I mean especially the way things are now even when it's done I mean the days of like finishing the film and selling it to the distributor you know and they kind of take it from there it seems like those are over you know it's like everybody's kind of doing more and more on their own and you're able to do more and more now um, but in any case it, it's from getting the permissions. From the people to shoot to, to shooting it and making sure you got the story to post to finishing to selling it I mean it's it's a long long process and so I would just say make sure you really 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 want to make that film it's <laughs> great thanks Barry yeah, if you want to that, uh, I didn't realize how much I didn't like the Kazakh language so that might have been something I should have figured out from the beginning <laughs> a foreign language film is so difficult in post production oh my God. Th this is streaming by the way Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How many people in Kazakhstan do you think are watching? Loves the people. <laughs> Both of you. <laughs> loves the people. The language is difficult. Yeah, I, I would just double the echo. It's all about passion. And um, I guess ours, our documentary stories, we don't have to live with for two years. We live with them for about a month and then put them on TV. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, the ones that I get most excited about are ones that either reopen an interest of mine, like, you know, music festival, that was such a part of my life in high school, so, like, being able to bring that back now is really exciting, and just things that I get to learn about something new. Fantastic. Um, you want to tell us about your mini-docs? I'm curious, actually. Oh, thanks. Okay, so my mini-docs, they were... Um, they were funded, and that really was the influence, all right? So, <laughs> so what was happening at that time was, uh, you know, we were kind of launching this, okay, you know, we're a video production company, and I had just made a feature film and, um, you know, touched on some emotional subjects, and I thought this is really interesting. And quite honestly, it was, okay, what's the rest of the crew doing now? And, uh, you know, we'll find out during that, uh, oh, well, we do commercials and we do this and that until the next film comes along. I said, well, let me, I love these folks. Let me see if I can put something together you know, that maybe we could work on together again. And I actually had uh, what became a client, you know, a long-time client um, that's in the education space. Without saying too much about it, it was very much in the education space here in America. So, A, they were starting off, and all of a sudden, boom, Gates Foundation. Here's millions. So let's start going out and doing mini docs and finding out the state of education in America. So next thing you know, we're on overnight flights to Detroit, you know, right in the center of, you know, unemployment and, uh, you know, what used to be the biggest city in the fastest growth in America, you know, just like the American dream was, you know, Detroit. You know, you come here and all of a sudden you can work and you can make a living in the middle class dream and have a family and they can be educated. And uh, what happened since, you know, the obviously the automobile, you know, uh, industry collapse and so many other things. Behind all that was the education system. Gosh, I guess I'm getting into the story a little bit, aren't I? Um, so... <laughs> So it was. It was very. Uh, so I, I actually fell in love with this 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 topic, and the in you know, and it, now it was finding the characters, I guess, you know, the, the people that are living this and bring their stories out. 
and um, and what's happening to their now second generation, their kids that aren't able to get an education like probably everybody in this room, if you were raised in this country, public schools, you know, and so forth, was you know a good path to uh, you know a, a decent job, a good way of life, taking care of your family, and over the past couple of decades, it's really changed, and I had no idea, had no idea, and just just as the you know filmmaker for these things, and that was the whole point. They wanted everybody to know that you know things have changed in America and that we think we're at the top. And if you take a look at films like, um, you know, there was the uh, um, uh, participant did Waiting it, for Waiting for Superman. Thank you. Yeah, and the lottery. You know, both talking about how people want their their kids to get into the finest schools so they can have a better future and just how heartbreaking it was. Uh, you know, the people that don't get their kids into the charter schools or the better schools. So that's what our two-year crusade became: going to Vegas and Detroit and in Richmond outside of San Francisco, you probably will never step foot in. You certainly wouldn't do it wearing red or blue. We were not allowed to wear red or blue in those neighborhoods because we could be shot just for wearing that. And that, you know, these kids, you know, 13-year-old kids that lost two of their friends because they wore blue jeans, you know, or the wrong sneakers, just unbelievable. So it was a real eye-opener. So that's what we started doing. So these are the mini docs. So great. So, um... They're distributed through, you know, this is really, it was, it was a cause, you know, it was part of the cause. So we didn't get, you know, big distribution, uh, we didn't get a uh, distribution deal. They were on the web, they were in live meetings, they were brought to senators, congressmen, uh, mayors, you know, from, you know, from Via Garosa, the whole way up the state and around the country, to actually transforming some laws. So we started doing a lot of videos that they would literally put on their iPads and go and say, today's the day that this law is being passed. So it became part of a lobby. And they would say, "This is this is these are your consist constituents, you know. These are the folks that are going to vote for you or not." And this is what they're saying. And they changed some laws in, in Detroit and Cleveland, and it was really very gratifying to be able to help, uh, you know, that population. Um, it, it's, it's our population, you know. Um, so that's how we got involved. Thank you for asking. So that was actually that led to something. So they were funded, right? So I'm kind of wondering where uh, you, uh, I think your story is, you know, for where you are right now, they're funded as well, but where are you finding funding for these projects? You know, where's, are you going out and are you pitching the idea or is there, there's money already there typically and how would these folks go out and find, uh, you know, they find the passion, maybe something they really care about, how are they going to get the funding or is it just the every weekend and every night after seven, I'm going out and shooting my doc? <laughs> Since that's how I that's how I started, I, I started basically by just um, pounding the pavement and asking everyone I knew, "Hey, this is what we're doing. This is the the idea of the film and uh, of my first film. That's how that one started." And eventually, there was a production company that said, "This is right in line with what we're trying to do, and we have some money." And I had somebody else on the line for a little bit of money, and then they fell through. And then so I said to the production company, "Hey, can you give me some more?" And they said, "Okay," basically. But we did it fairly cheap on that one. Um, and sometimes there's an angel, you know, on the on the Kazakhstan one, the angel was basically supporting her for, for her film. And that's how she brought me on. I, it was the third time shooting, so he had already put a lot of money in. They hadn't got any story, and that's when she brought me in to do that. But I had to kind of keep walking him through the process because of that and say, here's the budget, and this is why, you know. So dealing with an angel is interesting like that. They're behind the cause. They want the cause, but they want to know after a certain time that something's going to come out. Uh, and when, you know, here's what we shot, give him a trailer. So a special promo for him. And, you know, I just get out there. I basically just get out there in every way I can. Right now with the series, I'm approaching everyone from distributors to, to my, my foreign sales agents to uh, independent financers, somebody in the space that likes it but knows that they can make money. So I'm looking for people that might already be aligned with my message that also is uber wealthy but doesn't mind making money. And it's, it's, it's a tough one to find, you know, but, uh, and that believes in it, you know, and believes that film is not just throwing your money away. So you definitely have to, to have your ducks in a row. I don't have a ton, but I'm also in the same way looking at companies, call it like someone like Citizens for Humanity, which is a jeans company, apparel, that has a similar um, ideology, that it believes in freedom and human expression that might see themselves aligned with us, especially because I have PBS that would like to show and Link TV that would like to show this series. So you can go out, yeah, and, and get your sponsors ahead of time uh, if you want to call it a sponsor or an advertiser. So that's, these are all options, I agree, and you have to just 
go for it, right? Keep brainstorming like that. I wish I had a secret key, but that's a good one. Maybe, maybe you will. No, no. <laughs> no, no key here. Um, no, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, and, and uh, that's interesting that you're, you've heard that on the street that there is no money because I – I've been lucky to make a living in documentary for many years, but uh, it really is tough. It's really, really tough, and I always wonder how people do it. I mean, at the the documentary channel, which doesn't exist anymore, but we were on the air for eight years, and you know, we were a real company. Um, we were licensing films for five to ten grand for two years, you know, all rights, and um, that's not a lot of money. And uh, Kate Pearson, who was our head of acquisitions, you know, everybody was just, I just, I don't want to make any money. I just want my money back. I just want the money I spent on this film. And she's like, five grand, sorry, that's it. You know, and, and we had a stack like this high of people who didn't want a dime. They just wanted it to get on the channel and, you know, get out there to 25 million homes. Um, so, and then, you know, Kate, some of them we, we um, paid up to 20 or 25 if it was you know, like an Oscar winner from six, seven years ago or something like that. Um, but, yeah, I agree with what uh, Adam and, and this gentleman were saying. I mean, it's really hard. I wish I knew the answer. Angel Investors is how a lot of the documentaries I worked on got made. I'm, I'm curious now to find out more. I mean, how do you put something on YouTube and raise 150 grand? I mean, that sounds like a miracle. I don't know how you did that, but it sounds... Yeah, the, the number one rated film on the channel the whole time was called The Price of Sex, which was a very serious film about sex trafficking in, um, I think, Thailand or somewhere. But, um, you know, it's interesting because there's more outlets than there's ever been, but less money, it seems like. But there's still a lot of people out there doing it. One of my favorite, it's my favorite doc of like the last five years. I, basically, um, it's a story it, it's one of those films it's funny because I tell a lot of people I say go to Netflix watch The Imposter it's on streaming they'll ask me what it's about I said I, I can't tell you I can't if I tell you it'll ruin it you know so I, I don't really don't want to talk about it but um, <laughs> it's, it's go to Netflix streaming and, re and watch The Imposter it's a great film but there's a lot of recreations and he talked a lot about how he spent a tremendous amount of time and effort and money doing those creations just right and they are. They're done amazingly well. And recreations is actually something else that, you know, is a, one of those topics in documentary that always comes up. But I think if you do them right, you know, they're fun. Why don't we, why don't we address two things there then? What, what about recreations? Actually, let me ask a question. How many of you are in the process or thinking of or developing, you know, funded making a doc right now? Okay, good. Um, interested in the recreation thing because we, we talked about that and is it going to be authentic is it going to look real or is it going to just crush the movie and, and the followers that we have so I'm curious about that what do you, how do you, you you kind of answered it somewhat and maybe yeah again I would say if it's done right I mean if it's done cheesy like you know I, I, Errol Morris has done it um, there's a film called Standard Operating Procedure he did some really is about Abu Ghraib and he did these incredible tracking shots of like the prison and you would see like their feet and their hands. And um, so I think if it's done right, it's, it's really hard to, it's, that's kind of a tough one to say, well, what does done right mean? I mean, you can tell when it's wrong. I mean, you know, when the, you know, it's like, well, we'll make it black and white and, you know, make it a little fuzzy and, you know, show the murder or something. I, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's a tough one. But in general, I don't like them. I would. I think it's better if you can do it without them. Mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes it's 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 just hard because you don't have the footage. Yeah, I, I'm with that. I I don't do them, so I don't know have much to say on it. But uh, but poetry is wonderful. You know what I mean? Poetry in terms of whatever shots you want to use or maneuvering in some way. Not necessarily what someone says, but the way you portray it, the poetry of it, I think, is is sweet. And I learned that from some of my editors you know, that said, "Look, you know, relax. <laughs> it's poetry. You know, it's okay if that rain happened a little bit earlier than it really happened. It's okay. We're making a point. We're saying something. It's okay. It did happen. You know. Uh, so, so I loosened up to that in 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 making films and realizing there's a greater point to be made. It didn't matter. There's that little detail." Then the other the other point was what the gentleman talked about is uh, 
is branding, you know, and, and uh, funding and that sort of thing. And I'm definitely going to be the advocate of that, I guess, you know, probably among this panel because that's where everything that we did, <laughs> that's it, that's, you know, the company that I have now was based on that, w was based on, you know, a slight nod, you know, they may, you know, sometimes not even a logo at the end, you know, nothing, you know, but we were doing a story, but it was so obvious as the way, you know, what people were saying, you know, who could back this, that sort of thing. So approaching other, it, it, it branched us out to many other, in this case, you know, education nonprofits and, and charities. And then, quite honestly, it was education software. So I do a lot for education software now. So, you know, now it came from these documentaries to iPad apps that are teaching, you know, kids. And so we're doing animation, all these kind of things. But that was the, the funny path of, of our company and still love doing some of the charity uh, and nonprofits and the education story. But those folks, these corporations, are there to do something Believe it or not, they're there to do something good, and that's to give all these people jobs and to keep growing. And they kind of have to. That's the machinery that it is. So I'm not against it at all. But sometimes there, you'll find some people in the in the marketing department or business development that'll say, "Yeah, this this actually could be fantastic." And like he did with the adult toy company, you know, there are other folks out there that say, "Yeah, we can get behind this." And here's X amount, you know, if we get something at the end or you know, make some introductions for you and that kind of thing. So I think going to brands is actually very, uh, I think it's a very strong idea. I think it's very difficult typically for the filmmaking, you know, community to do that. Uh, you haven't been, you know, taught that. We never learned that. Um, but I think it's a pretty strong move. Um, any, any luck or anything on, did you have a question? So uh, the question was on distribution, which I was going to kind of move into. I was thinking about, you know, that marketing pitch, you know, what, do you, what you walk in the door with, are you going to an agent? Are you going to a manager? Are you going to a you know, distribution house? And if so, who are the best? Or are you going, well, it'll be in the best festivals that are out there, and I'll get picked up then, um, which it can happen. That certainly can happen, but I think it's a very active process. So I'm wondering what your, what your take on all that is. Do you have a specific, specific <laughs> question or just a general? Like you said, there, there's a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, you can go into the festivals and hope you get picked up. The highest pass did get picked up because of that, and it wasn't because of a big festival. I didn't think the highest pass would get into the Sundance and Arlo, just the style of it uh, and what it's about. Uh, it was at Topanga Film Festival, and it happened to be that we won the top award there in Cinema Libre, a studio here, a distribution studio, loved it and wanted to take it on. And they understood what we were doing and saw the niche market for it, so fantastic. So we got theatrical re release, but you know, distribution has its. It's uh, it's troubles too, you know. I mean, they spend money, and so it's more difficult to end up getting money back because of it. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a learning process. I'll tell you that I am no by no means an expert, but I'm learning all the time, and it's a good experience to to release a film theatrically and see actually what it costs and how you're going to end up making your money back. And they admittedly say if we break even on a theatrical release of a documentary, we have done fantastic, just in that portion. Okay, just to get the money back that it costs to take it out to theaters, even if it's small, a couple cities, five cities, ten cities, whatever it is. Uh, so there's no money real there. They just hope that it boosts up the DVD sales by having been out there. And, of course, we got the L.A. Times because of it. We got a full-page article in the L.A. Times because we were in theaters, which would have been probably a $40,000 ad, but I found somebody that loved motorcycles, and she dug it, and they had a sweet thing. Uh, the universe kind of provided for us. Um, the, the other one, like the Kazakhstan one, one thing I probably, you know, might be good to think about is TV, and maybe you can speak to that, to thinking about your doc in terms of TV, and because that's a great place, I think, to get it distributed rather than thinking theatrically. Oh, how can I make this with a station in mind or even talk to someone beforehand? And, and maybe you can tell us a little more about that if you have some experience there. Sure. Um, well, I, I was talking with that other guy who's not here anymore um, uh, about – our channel, which isn't around anymore either, but uh, <laughs> and he's at the channel. Uh, yeah, he went looking for it. Um, <laughs> and well, I, I just kind of wanted to step back for one second because you know he, he was saying that you know there's no money, and I was kind of chiming in, and, and it's true that in a lot of ways, but I really would rather. I, I really don't want to give like a negative vibe from this conference. I mean, I think that's the wrong thing. I think if you have a great subject and you're passionate about it. The good thing about now, it is tougher to get distribution. It's really tough to get distribution, but the good thing is that there's 
first of all, the tools are so cheap. I mean, I started off when there was film or film. You know, it was 16 or 35. And either one was really expensive. The cameras were expensive, the film and the processing expensive. Y you know, you couldn't just go make a film. You, you had to raise the money. Now, I mean, everybody, everybody can make a film. People are making films with their iPhones. And, and the software, you know, the editing software is, you know, everybody has. And so, to me, you know, it's, that's really exciting. Um, because you can go do it. And so if, if you are really passionate about a subject, you know, I'd say, you know, just go. If you can't raise the money, you know, just go for it. Just start shooting it yourself or whatever. Um, so I'm just trying to be positive. Now on the negative side, <laughs> um, it is really hard. Like I said, our channel, we paid very little. Channels like HBO show great documentaries, but as far as I know, I've never worked there, but have dealt with them quite a bit, and they're, you know, they're all commissioned themselves. It's films that um, Sheila Nevins wants to make, and she hires filmmakers. I think they do buy some occasionally, but it's mostly they're commissioned by themselves. And, you know, I'm sure AMC and Bravo and <coughs> IFC and <coughs> there's a channel called Ovation. They all show docs somewhat, and so they have to license them. I, I you know, I, I couldn't sit here and tell you the best way to get it to them, but, you know. They're out there, and um, but I, I, I think film festivals is a good way to start because there's so many of those now too, and and so there, you can definitely get into some of them, and you start building a rep, and you know, YouTube and all those other things. I, I wish I had more. That's great. That's great. Okay. Anything, Katie? I mean, our our show came out of work for um, health related like PSAs. And then just through a pitching process to KCET. So I don't know that I can really speak to funding. Um, but in terms of distribution, it was really a subject matter that the channel wanted. And they were trying to find new programming. So it, it was a subject they were interested in. I, I have a comment just on, um, you know, this, case, this actually comes up in every one of these panels, not just the ones I'm moderating. But... You know, the, the, if you're if you're out there making docs, you're, you you want to write and you're, you you want to produce. You know, you're filmmakers. I, I it seems to be just, you know, here's the thing, just do it, just keep on doing it. You know, when we were, you know, as as a pseudo manager producer for a couple of writers, and we were because we were out pitching all the time, and we're at Sony and Sci-Fi and here, and we're doing all these things. It, you know, I, the 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 attitude was. You know, let me see what you've done lately. I mean, what have you done for me lately? So I was thinking, you know what? They have to be doing. I'm doing a web series right now, and if I'm not doing that, I'm writing. A, I'm writing a, a film. You should see the first 15 pages. If I'm not doing that, just you have to be active. So I think the the idea of oh, I'm not going to pick up the iPhone or go get that 5D and start shooting. I think that's wrong. I think that you should go and do it. I think you should get as much activity as you can, even if it is a hobby, because it leads you to new people, and it opens new doors. And if you're doing what you love, that becomes apparent, and people want to be around that. And then the people that are you know, the distributors and the people at the festivals, and you meet somebody, and it just opens these doors, not to even mention the social networks that you should all be on, not hitting people up for money every single day, but just saying, oh, we did this great interview. You know, oh my gosh, you should see this, you know, this, this Harley Davidson that we, you know, we rigged together on the shoot in the Himalayas. You know, I mean, that kind of just cool stuff that's happening out there. The activity generates activity. So I, that's just kind of my own personal, you know, I'd say mantra. And I was kind of wondering if you would, maybe not mantra, but would you agree with that? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, why not? If you feel <laughs> passionate about it and you, can, and you can and you can make it happen, go for it. I, myself with the with the highest pass, I said I wasn't going to do it and get locked into something for like nine years. You know, like I'm not going to go with a handy cam and film it. That was just my my mantra at that time. I'm like I'm going to either raise money and do it full on and well, or I'm not filming it for that one. That was just where I was like, and we got the money. Other ones I might say screw it. Like this last one, you know, I just had a different idea to it and a different vision, so I could go a little more cheap or less budget. Um, but yeah, so. That's what I would say. Your vision, man. Your vision, however you want to live it. Um, I was just going to say something about social media um, because it does seem like that, obviously, is really important now. And, you know, to me, it's all kind of newer than a lot of – I mean, I've been in Facebook now a few years and all this. But um, I have been seeing that what you were just saying, that it seems like the, the, the campaigns that have been successful is like – 
I mean, you don't want to be obnoxious, but they post a ton of stuff. It's like they show all the different steps, and, you know, it used to be you wouldn't want to show everything you're doing, you know? I mean, if it's for whatever reason, you know, you just want to kind of wait for the big day when you have your screening. But now it seems like, you know, show them your camera you're shooting. Show them everything. And uh, it kind of generates, I guess, generates excitement. I think I think it shows activity, it shows interest, it shows you're passionate about it, and I think that that's that authenticity is the, one of the most important pieces of, you know, social because social isn't this you know thing that just kind of out there. It's us. It's people like us that are on it. You know, we're connecting person to person. So um, I would definitely go that route. Any thoughts? Um, yeah, I was actually going to say I think that social media has also been pretty interesting in connecting with the subjects. Um, just. I'm new to Twitter, even though I'm of the social media generation, and um, just the number of people that I've been able to connect with in a way that it used to be, you know, going through their PR reps and all these different avenues. Now I, I literally just tweet to them, and they tweet back to me, and I have an interview for my story. So I think it's a great resource. Um, basically, though, the short answer is I would say the more you can learn, the better. Because like you say, if you always have to hire people to do everything, you know, especially like the assistant editing stuff, because you might just need to go look at something or, or make a little quick time to send to somebody or something like that. And if you always have to hire somebody to do it, then... Um, Sometimes we're coming back with so much footage and so little time for the editors, and I really feel for the editors that I am so involved, I am, you know, throwing scripts at them to help here, 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 choose this, take this, take this. They're long, of course. In essence, I'm giving them a, st a string out, so I do. I, I know every bit of footage. I, I have. That's how I see it. I have to. Much like a, a you know, a, if you're the head producer on a TV show, you would know all the, you would know the footage. So you could say, no, remember in season six, she said that. Let's use that piece of footage in season seven. You know, whatever it is, you would really be able to pull it for a reality show, something like that. You would know your, sh your footage backwards. No, no, that I would not me, <laughs> not me personally. I don't like that. I, I would rather an assistant editor that can prep the thing totally correctly in the first place, right? And then to be able to myself have the skills, like you're saying, have the skills to be able to look through and find what you want to find is, ver is very important because I, I like to be hands-on. I want to be able to look at what I want and think through things and, and come up with the story and then be able to sit with our editor and have a conversation, a real story conversation. And you can tell when your fellow producer, you know, I had a co-director when he hadn't been up to date on the footage, you can tell. Because I'm talking about story, and he doesn't know certain things. How how can you talk about story if you don't know what exists? How can how are you going to grasp a two and a half hour rough cut if you don't know what you can also be pulling on or what's not there? And someone says, "Oh, why don't you do this?" And you're like, "It's impossible. I don't have that footage." So it's somebody who you know of, but you don't know. Okay. Um. <laughs> and you want to make a film about them. Is no? it somebody here? <laughs> well, I, I, it's hard to I'd say you got to try to get to know them. I mean, I don't know. I don't really have any more info than that. But. What? Uh, no, I knew Anand, the, who led the trip intimately, and he approached me with the trip as it was, so that was not a problem. And he trusted me inherently that I wouldn't create something that would uh, not honor his teachings in that one. So that's all. Maybe from the for the city city walk. Maybe are you guys coming across people or? Yeah, I actually um, that that actually is kind of my favorite part is finding these people. Um, Twitter was is one way, um, but yeah, I think just my approach has always been to really try to find a connection with them and explain why I'm so passionate about whatever it is they do. Um, like currently, just working with musicians, it's easy for me to say, you know, I'm from LA and I really love, you know, your inspiration you draw from the city or, you know, somehow find a connection with them. And also um, I found just really proving the kind of trust that Adam was talking about that you'll, you'll hold their story like with the highest respect or find a connection with them. It, or did you mean one step before that, even just approaching them or even how to find them? This is a joke. Yeah, I had to get the permission from India to even shoot there. You know, uh, the jewel of India. I put it in the film at the end. Thank you to the, the the heart of the Indian government and the jewel that they are for letting us film there because it's really serene places. But some of the monks and things. Yeah, I just 
I couldn't. I couldn't. Where I have somebody, uh, I do my best when on camera, and sometimes I just don't worry about another, especially when I'm in far off lands, because the. For all the ones that were really necessary, the main characters, of course. A lot of stuff's in public, so it's not a, such a big deal, um, public places, per se. Um, and then, of course, there's E&O insurance as well that can, can cover you. Yeah, E&O you know, insurance, you know, which I then had to ask. I had to ask my investors for a little money for that, you know? Yeah, E&O you know, insurance is one of those things that new filmmakers usually don't know about. And I saw a great cartoon once, <laughs> and there was a filmmaker, and he's, like, tearing his hair out. And he's yelling at his producer, like, you know, insurance. Know. Why didn't anybody tell me about <laughs> that? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Where were you going to get the money for that? But yeah, there's a big gray area with that, obviously, and and it, a lot of it depends on your personality, how much risk you want to take. But um, my, my general feeling is to be bold about it. You know, it's a documentary. It's probably never going to be seen by anybody. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, this is how I. I rationalize it. It's like, worst comes to worst, you know, the, the, the film gets made, it becomes really popular, some guy sees himself in there, th th and he goes, oh, I didn't have a, you know, th they never got a release from me, I'm going to sue them. You know, hey, then then you got pub any publicity is good publicity, right? I, don't know. <laughs> I know it probably sounds old and jaded, but. <laughs> that's good. Any other questions? Well, if you're shooting something that's, Planned, like if you're going to go to a, f well, you know, a film festival is generally, I think, assumed by any attorney or anything that everybody knows it's a festival. And it's, but let's say another public place and you're going to shoot interviews there or shoot part of your film there. What they usually do is they put up these signs that says, you know, we are filming here. You are, you know, you are going to be on camera, blah, blah, blah. Just basically, and then you film that, you know, you film that with your cameras that, you know, show that that sign was up at that location, and that's sort of like, I, I forget the exact term, but it's like a, a crowd release. Yeah, or a location release or an event release. Well, I don't think YouTube's not going to pull it because of that. I mean, it would only be if the person sees it. Well, you should have a release from anybody who's featured, yeah. It really depends on the answer. Oh, you mean location permits? Yeah. Yeah. No, I would say it's. I would say it's. Again, if it's a show that's like on television, it's a produced show that is part of a series. That's a whole other thing. I mean, if you're talking about an independent documentary person out there trying to make their own film, where you don't know where it's going to end up, I think obviously you have to be aware of those things. Um, you know. You know put Rolling Stones as your soundtrack and things like <laughs> that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but there, there, there are different rates. I mean, you know, when you're going to pulling permits from different locations, if you're doing a, you know, a, a narrative or a film in Santa Monica, it's going to be quite pricey. But if you say it's a, you know, under $5,000 documentary interview, you know, then it's like 150 bucks. I mean, if you check around, you might be surprised at what you find if you just, it's low budget, it's doc, it's an interview or whatever. And it's, uh, we've always erred on the side of, safety because you know again i got kind of brands with us you know that kind of thing right. i don't want them getting in any hot water yeah. and then the other thing you mentioned about um you know anybody under 18 i don't uh, it's it's feet and you know it's they're walking or hands ringing that kind of stuff i don't want i just i i personally just want to protect their privacy i don't want them on camera um so i'm really careful about that you know back of the head walking away that kind of deal um but i, I kind of the same way public place but we do as much as we can to diffuse the background as, as much as possible. Anybody that's featured or they're speaking, absolutely. If, if we don't have the paper, we ran out of them, absolutely. We'd love, you know, yes, I agree to be on this. <laughs> Depends on where in Los Angeles because, you know, Los Angeles, if it's not Santa Monica and it's not West Hollywood, you know, every, every uh, what is it, you know, city. Yeah, 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 gotcha. Yeah, you're, I, I think I know what you're talking about, um, uh, reality docu show that I was just producing did something similar to that um, however you're very restricted to a grid and if you go outside of that grid you know you're like adding in Beverly Hills that's a whole nother section Venice Santa Monica those are huge and also just Hollywood 
in general, like Hollywood Boulevard, there's a, I mean, you, if you try to shoot uh, at Grauman's, you will get shut down in like, it was crazy, like under 0.5 seconds, <laughs> they just rush you. Um, but I was going to say in general with like our show, you know, we would go to a larger event with a press pass, so we wouldn't need a location permit for that. It's the same idea as what Barry was saying. There's a sign, everyone knows they may be on camera because there's just tons of press at these events. Um, so that that would never require a location permit, but something like Hollywood Boulevard, you'd you'd really want to like cover your bases. Sound package, and you'll be okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Could get out of makeup, and then <laughs> that is a big good boy. So, um, so I was going to ask one more question, and then we'll start to wrap up. So think about maybe some final questions. And what I was going to ask is. Any, uh, any, you know, either horror stories, scary stories, or favorite, you know, maybe catching a scene or an interview with somebody, you know, special, or you were almost went off the cliff over there, you know, that kind of thing. Anything that you want to share that's just kind of of interest? You probably have, you probably have some good I'm horror I'm stories. I'm scrolling. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if this is really a horror story, but it's a really interesting story. I was... In film school, I, I originally moved out here to go to SC Film School, and the first semester there, as a grad, you make five, at that time, Super 8 films. Now I'm sure it's digital. But um, so, and I uh, I was down at Venice Beach. I had just moved out here. I didn't know anybody or anything. And I was down at Venice Beach, and I, I think they still have it. Once a year, they have, like, the, the Hare Krishnas have, like, a big fundraiser. And I don't know if they still have that. But they did back then, in any mm -hmm. case. So there was a Hare Krishna guy with a 16 millimeter camera, and um, you know I just started talking to him because because he had a camera more than that he was Hare Krishna, and um, you know because I was interested. So he was the guy, like the guy who made all their films, and <clears throat> so I kind of I thought this was pretty clever, especially now when I look back on it. I kind of he wanted me, of course, after I was talking to him a while, he's telling me about the camera and what he does filming. You know, he was interested in having me become a member, you know, or and, and all that. And I wanted to, to film in their, I wanted to do a little documentary, Super 8, in their uh, temple. And so I kind of pretended and let, went along for a month uh, that I was going to join. And, and he let me come to the temple and shoot on Super 8 in, in the temple. And they didn't realize, because I was like, like this. I mean, I was right in people's faces, you know, finally. So I got some of the close-up stuff, and then they kind of tapped me on the shoulder, like, hey, dude, like, get in the back, you know, and they kind of went front and way back. I got wide stuff, but it turned out to be a really nice little film, and um, so that's my story. Did you have an interesting hairdo during that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, I didn't return his phone calls after that. <laughs> so I never cut my hair. I think one of the horror stories would be in Kazakhstan. We went out to one of the, where one of the nuclear bombs had exploded, and um, it's not a true like horror story. Other than you know, as a producer out there, and I, we covered ourselves head to toe. I I did um, because I and I mean everyone knew it, but the, although it had been a long time since these bombs had exploded, there's a lot of these elements still in the dirt, in the dust, and blowing around, and you don't want to be. It's not high radiation at that point, and if you're with a you know the Dosimeter, it's not very high. You're okay. You don't want to stay there long, but it's not absurd. But it's everywhere. It's in the water. It's in the dust, and you just don't want to be breathing it in and ro rolling around. And I was, you know, scarfing this, and I threw those clothes away, and I threw those shoes away, and I didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, and and my DP, this you know, 26 year old guy, is just like rolling around in the dirt, just getting the shot. So for me, that's a bit of a horror story in, in, in that, you know, we're telling him, hey, you got to be careful, but just so passionate. And, and even the main girl in the film, it lulls you to sleep, this thing called radiation, lulls you to sleep. You have no, you can't taste it, you can't see it. And so that was like one of the horrifying things for me is like, I know in my mind, but I'm also becoming desensitized to it at the same time. And I know that's what happens with these villagers and they're just absolutely desensitized and don't re remember that it's everywhere and they really shouldn't be there. And uh, so that, that was horrifying. And then on the favorite side was being in the Himalayas and, and similar to being in the Hare Krishnas, we, we got to visit an oracle, you know, like in the Matrix, like the oracle. You get to go see a lady that can channel spirit and really, uh, sp she speaks in Tibetan, she channels spirits. And they allowed us to film in there and to be able to see the, the oracle and my teacher, like forehead to forehead and have that on film was just 
absolutely special, absolutely stunning. <laughs> Full of them. Um, no, I actually, I think what's kind of funny about production is that you have horror stories as it's happening, but once it's over, they're all somewhat happy memories. Um, <laughs> But I would say my horror story is probably straight out of film school. I was camera operating, and my director forced us to go into Skid Row without any permits or any like preparation. But the most horrifying part to me was that there was very little respect for the people there. And so I think like you know, technical horror stories can happen all the time, and you can recover. But you just really need to have. Uh, certain level of compassion for your subject and not not take advantage of people in their stories so that that was something I did not appreciate so any any uh I guess maybe mine I don't you know I th those are wonderful so I don't ours was getting chased out of Detroit on eight mile you know and I we, we sped out of there because all our gears all right so a few minutes before it's getting dark we're doing this interview and you know we've got very, you know, we got the expensive gear, we got the whole package out and that kind of stuff, and then the lights are dimming, and it's getting dark, and we're all told this is not where you want to be when it gets dark, looking, you know, like you look. So, um, you know, the guy that was doing the interview was like, you got to go, you know, because he's, he's you know, there's some cars kind of pulling up, you know, eyeing all the gear and, you know, that kind of stuff. So we, we, we kind of got chased out of there, and it was, you know, oh, wow, this is eight mile, there's the street. This is what Eminem was talking about. Okay, let's get to the airport now. So it was that kind of thing. It was just kind of funny. I used to live on nine miles. Oh, really? It's not a... Uh, it's very different. Eight to nine is very different. Is that right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Eight is like the edge. Gotcha. Like you go into town at three. Uh, yeah. I, uh, and they didn't, uh, they didn't seem to have any funding for the roads, and you know they, everything was closed. <laughs> hey, I'm not kidding. I mean, they were the what was the highway or whatever was completely closed, and and so you know it wasn't like you know Google knew how to reroute us or anything. Because <laughs> we're er, you know back out and that kind of thing. So, um, any final questions for the panel? No. Well, then thank you all. Thank you very much for being here. Really great insight. Wish you the best.